talk, talk to me. WSRadio.com The San Diego Council on Literacy brings you Literacy for All with your host, Jose Cruz. Welcome to the show. I'm Jose Cruz from the San Diego Council on Literacy. You're listening to the Literacy for All radio show on WS Radio, and we have a special guest uh, with us today, uh, <clears throat> Peter Wait, Peter, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a description of, of your background, but first of all, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much, Jose. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm so glad to have you, and I uh, appreciate, uh, you know, this is, there, there have been some, some folks on this show, people you know, and it's like, why hasn't Peter been on the Literacy for All radio show? We've had a few legends on this show, including Ruth Colvin, who's the founder of LBA. And, um, and Peter, whether you know it or acknowledge it yourself, you're, you're one of the legends. I, I can't imagine doing this work without you. Um, and, uh, and so now you're on the show. That's a good thing. And I, um, uh, I kind of look at what we're doing today is the, is the Peter, Peter Waite story. I think somebody has got to record it if it has been put out there already. Cause you have a long uh, career in adult literacy. Um, so before I, we get into that and we're going to go way back, Peter, this is your life, Peter Waite. Um, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. All righty. And, um, just, uh, just a little background. Um, and Peter has worked with pro literacy as exec- executive vice president for 35 years. Now we know part of that was in, in the uh, uh, the Lawbach years, Lawbach Literacy Action, and then um, and yeah, like right, give or take a few years, and then a, a number of major functions in, to advance literacy, including U.S. and internet and international programs, as well as publishing for New Readers Press uh, during that time period, and then uh, Peter has served on a number of presidential and congressional advisory boards and served as the chair of the National Coalition for Literacy twice. I want to talk about that group, too. And right now you're consulting with a number of literacy groups and national service organizations, including the Corporation for National and Community Service. I thought you wanted to start fishing more. That sounds like you're busy, man. <laughs> well, good good question. But, Jose, as, as you well know, that uh, literacy gets in your blood, and, and once it is in your blood, it's pretty hard to separate it. And uh, at the risk of this being a mutual admiration society, you know, Jose, you, you've been an equal icon yourself in, in both the work you've done in California, but also nationwide, because, um, you know, I think the listeners should appreciate, Jose, that, you know, you served on a number of our national boards. You presently serve on the board of trustees for pro-literacy, um, and you've served as uh, chair of our governance council, uh, as well as numerous other councils and groups uh, and, and very active nationally and well-known around the country for your work, particularly around coalitions, advocacy, and capacity building. And, and you know, thank you, Peter. Um, that makes me feel really good. And uh, I didn't know that this is where my my life was going to take me. It's just, it's just one of the things with literacy. And I just want to add real quickly that, you know, literacy people, people like you and and being in this experience uh, over the last 35 years for me, um, uh, you know, the literacy actually raised me. <laughs> so there's a whole lot that I've learned and such. But uh, you you got into this field, and I'm not sure if that's what your intent was. Um, you know, what, what what were you thinking about? Let's say when you were in high school and getting ready to go to college, what were your what were your career plans? Yeah, well, it, it was it's interesting because I think I was perhaps one of those lucky folks, Jose, who really did have a chance to be able to sort of live out their calling. Um, and probably the seminal time period, you know, was in college where I just you know, felt that, um, you know, I really wanted to do something that could touch people's lives and, and try and work in an area or a field that would uh, try and, and leave the world a little better place than what I had going into it. And so, um, you know, looking at those particular issues, I had started some work after college. Uh, actually, I, I probably had kind of an ill-fated start, actually, Jose, where I worked in a correctional center, um, actually in this correctional center. It was actually in northern Vermont, and uh, it, I, we had three, three of the residents, three of the inmates there. Um, I was tutoring, and they oh. had very low basic skills and hadn't done very much. And I thought I was doing terrific until one day when I came in and I, uh, 
I was called into the warden's office where he proceeded to tell me, Peter, you're doing a great job. We're really proud of you. But uh, the bad news is that uh, all three of your prisoners uh, last night escaped with tools oh. they'd been keeping in your desk. Oh, my goodness. The things they learned from you, Peter. Um. <laughs> right. L- yes. Literacy and context. Okay. But um, all things considered, uh, after a couple of weeks out in the lamb, all three of them returned and we kept working. But it, it just caught me in terms of how it really could change people's lives, uh, at least for the better. Uh, certainly not for escaping, but, but to try to give them a chance to be able to not return. And how, and how old were you? Yeah. So that would have been uh, back. I was just about uh, 21 years old, I think, is when mm-hmm. that kind of started. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and and, um, and you had had in your mind already uh, community service, making the world a better place. You know, being involved in the people business. Um, given your background, uh, where you were raised, the family. You know, I don't want to get too much into things, but where do you think that came from? Was that just you know Peter Wait? This it's something that your family's done. Things that 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 you were taught growing up. Yeah, great, great question. As always, Jose. Um, you know, I think w- one of the one of the things that kind of touched me was I, I went uh, to college. I started college in 1969, and uh, so as you may recall, that uh, 69 and, and into 70, um, you know, college campuses were a very vibrant location, um, and we had uh, uh, the Kent State. Um, killings and uh, some of the demonstrations relative to the Vietnam War, um, as well as a number of you know, social issue kinds of demonstrations mm-hmm. nationally. Mm-hmm. And that really struck me. It really struck me that there's just an awful lot of work to be done here in the United States. Right. Um, and I had, uh, so I signed up during my senior year to be a VISTA, continue my college, but also to be a VISTA, which is Volunteers in Service to America. Um, in a part of which the corporation will national service now. Mm-hmm. And that really gave me a, a wonderful baseline understanding um, you know, of what uh, not only some of the social needs were, but issues around poverty, issues around race, uh, issues around inequality. And from that point on, I just felt that there was a field that I really wanted to work in um, and can started primarily in youth services. But um, when I was in Seattle, Washington, I stumbled on that the organization uh, that was called Washington Literacy, and it was a statewide coordinating organization, uh, similar to one that was there in California with uh, California Literacy, uh, where you had got some of your literacy teeth, and um, and began working there, and that just really opened my eyes, and um, you know I've been I've been riding the literacy bandwagon ever since. Well, you're you're East Coaster, right, Peter? I mean, you mentioned Vermont. Uh, if that's accurate, how did you get out to Seattle? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it was well. You know, actually, that 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 trip was was really just my wife and I uh, thinking we wanted some adventures. And at the time, um, we were pretty active hikers and climbers, and uh, so we were looking for for bigger mountains and bigger adventures uh, out there. So, in addition to sort of stumbling on literacy and the importance of that, my wife was a teacher, um, went on out and taught, and then we just spent an awful lot of time. Um, out, out in Washington State and Oregon State, and down to California, mm-hmm. uh, climbing climbing some of those mountains. And uh, I've got uh, deep deeper roots because I was actually born in California. So uh, I'm a, I'm a Northern Bay boy, uh-huh. uh, born in, uh, in born in San Mateo. So I uh, you know had some West Coast orientation. Ultimately, however, migrated back because uh, the headquarters for Labonk Literacy at the time. Uh, is lo- was located in Syracuse, New York. Right. And so uh, after about five years there in Washington, uh, wandered back. They had asked me to head up a newly formed uh, U.S. office for Labonk Literacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I came back in uh, a long time ago now, about 1982, and, um, and have stayed on the East Coast but traveled an awful lot uh, with programs around the country during that time. Well. You, were you the first head of of the Lawbach U.S. office, Peter? I was. Yes, okay. I was sort of the the inaugural okay. head. They had had um, for a long time. Lawbach Literacy International was primarily focused on on the literacy needs internationally, mm-hmm, that's right. uh, which, as as you know, are, are just enormous. Um, you know, we have very significant challenges here in the U.S., uh, but you know there are 
challenges internationally uh, where you have uh, 70, 80, 90 percent of the population of a country which is completely illiterate. Right. And so for a long time, Frank Laubach, the founder of Laubach Literacy International, was really focused on doing work internationally and teaching trainers and teaching volunteers internationally. But as he traveled around the United States, uh, oftentimes in California, in fact, um, doing a lot of work, uh, trying to fundraise and trying to develop support, mm -hmm. more and more local program people would come to him and say, you know, we think we have a problem here. Right. Um, and they you know, slowly began then developing training programs and advertising for the needs here in the U.S. And lo and behold, uh, there was a stunning number. Yes. of individuals who came out wanting help, both native-born as well as foreign-born. And, and, and we come to a point in, in this story, Peter, and this is, uh, we're going to have to break in about 30 seconds or so, but, you know, here's, you know, here's the beginning, as, as I uh, experienced it, because I got into this work back in 1985, of the uh, exposing what we call America's best-kept secret. And so, right, here we have, we have challenges here. And uh, and looks like you were right at the uh, front of, of the attention being brought to that through uh, the U.S. Office of Laubach Literacy in 1982. Sure. And so uh, so we have uh, the next next chapter uh, coming up on the Peter Waite story here. And uh, just keep listening because you're learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. You're listening to the Literacy for All radio show. We're talking to Peter Waite. This is uh, WS Radio, the worldwide leader in Internet talk. a newborn baby in need? Sometimes the blessing of birth becomes complicated and perilous. Miracle Babies is there to help. Miracle Babies helps moms and dads give their all to their struggling little baby, but still need more. When you give to Miracle Babies, you help them give more. More skin-to-skin -skin care, breast milk, and love. Go to MiracleBabies.org and give right now. Be their miracle. Looking to be a successful entrepreneur? The virtual assistant industry continues to be a top choice for those looking to start their own business. The problem can be how to become a virtual assistant. Many turn to the Bible of the VA industry, the book, Virtual Assistant, the series, and it's the perfect guide for office managers, executive assistants, and other administrative professionals looking to make the transition from employee to successful business owner. Go to vatheseries.com to get your copy today. Small businesses are the lifeblood of America's economy. Every Thursday, SBA Radio interviews industry professionals and is dedicated to provide small businesses with timely insights and innovations. Visit www.sbaradio.us for details. Homeless veterans and their families are suffering and need our support, but many won't ask or don't know that help is within reach. Veterans Community Services is here to help. Amazingly, about 35% of the homeless in our neighborhoods are veterans with families. Low-income veterans or their friends are encouraged to contact Veterans Community Services and reach out for help with housing and other services. Call now, 800-974-9909. I raised $8,000 to build schools for South African children. After realizing how many people go hungry in San Diego, I now volunteer at a food pantry. I'm spending the next year doing volunteer projects across three countries and helping in ways they designate to be the most helpful. The World Link program at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice recognizes the potential of youth as agents of social change. Learn how you can help youth become a generation of leaders in action at peace.sandiego.edu. Can you imagine a world without children? A world where children don't play, or dream, or imagine. At St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, we're working every day to find cures for diseases that strike down children. Because we can't imagine a world without children. Can you? Finding cures, saving children. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. To learn how you can help, log on to our website, stjude.org. 
Donate cash, furniture, clothes, and other gently used household items to Father Joe's Villages and get a nice tax break in April. Every donation is tax deductible. Believe you can make a difference. Be Father Joe. Go to neighborhood.org or call 1-800-HOMELESS to donate today. Talk, talk to me. WSRadio.com The San Diego Council on Literacy brings you Literacy for All with your host, Jose Cruz. Welcome back to the show. I'm Jose Cruz. You're listening to the Literacy for All radio show on WS Radio. We're talking to Peter Waite, longtime literacy advocate. Um, uh, Peter, during the breaks, I'm I'm having a conversation with Wade Taylor, who runs the WS Radio uh, station here. And we get into different things. We talked about uh, access and such and how resources being out of balance kind of contribute to the problems. Um, and let me ask you if you agree with, with this statement, that literacy is one, or illiteracy is one of the problems out there that can be solved. Oh, boy, absolutely, Jose. I thought, you know, I, I've often described uh, the, the problem of illiteracy as America's most solvable problem. Um, you know, there are there are so many of the social issues, in fact, which, you know, are very complex and have really significant challenges in terms of solutions or we can only make a beginning. But if this country were to really take this as a serious seminal issue um, and an issue that's integrated into so many of the other social challenges that we have, we could get a handle on this particular problem and we could remediate the literacy challenge here uh, and, and seek universal literacy within a generation. Um, and again, it's, it's a generational issue because we need to address both the parents and the children. But during that, that one cycle, uh, this has an opportunity, we have an opportunity for this country to seriously address a problem that we can actually solve. And, and so what, uh, what's getting in the way, Peter? And I know it gets political, but, you know, we have to talk about reality. I know that, that you uh, have uh, – uh, no, you're not just an advocate. I mean, you're an advocate in the purest sense where you've talked to people in Congress. You, you probably have addressed Congress. I, I'm just going to guess. You tell me. Uh, and, and lobbied and such. And, and uh, here we are. We're still kind of – we're still having the same conversations we were having 35 years ago. We're still having to deal with this. We're still trying to generate the revenue to support uh, programs and um, and just um, and help emerging readers at all levels, and uh, and that shouldn't be the case. What's getting in the way? Sure. Well, great, great observation, Jose. And you know, as I as I look back, I you know can't help but think, uh, gee, when when you and I got started, I'm sure we both thought we were going to solve this problem in the course of our careers, and and he, he, here we are towards the end of those careers, um, and we haven't solved it yet, so shame on us. Um, but uh, it certainly hasn't been for lack of trying, mm-hmm. and I think that the reality of the circumstances, more to your point, in terms of what are some of the things that stand in the way of that. Certainly, um, you know, first and foremost is a lack of funding. Uh, oftentimes you hear the adage that, well, you know, this isn't a problem that you just can throw money at. Well, the fact is this is a problem that you could throw money at, <laughs> yes. and it doesn't take a lot of money. Uh, but if you were willing to, to double the existing allocation at the federal and state levels, which at the federal level is about $680 million, a drop in the bucket relative to other dollars, yes. and double that, and the state state contributions are about the same. If you would do that and then provide the kind of support that you need for both the public-based programs and the private not-for-profit programs and and individual volunteer programs, you could then begin to make a very serious dent into the the 20-odd million adults who are at the lowest levels, literacy levels, and begin to make those real changes. The second thing that, that you have to do, in addition to that very modest increase in funding, would be to ensure that the school districts have adequate funding to be able to help students who are struggling readers at the lowest levels. And there have been lots of efforts to do that. But in particular, you know, looking at those lower-performing schools and in schools uh, in communities of 
of significant poverty who simply don't have the kind of resources that they need as well. But in both circumstances, a very doable, doable opportunity to provide for a, a serious remediation of this problem. And, and we've had uh, champions in the past, uh, Peter, who have been just amazingly impactful going back to 1986 with, um, with, uh, with uh, George Bush, the first George Bush president. I think he was elected in 88. And Barbara Bush. Uh, we haven't had a champion like that. There have been others, uh, that I want to say Senator Tom Sawyer and such. Who, who's out there now or is no one out there now at that level advocating for, for adult literacy and literacy overall? Yeah, this is this is one of our real challenges, and we've talked about this as leaders in the field. We really lack the kind of champions that we had early on, Jose. Um, you know, Barbara Bush was a tireless champion of uh, doing that. Uh, former the late Senator Paul Simon, as you men- mentioned, you know, Congressman Tom Sawyer. Um, and we had, you know, many individuals who for years had been very long-time supporters. But... What happened is we did not build, we didn't build the second string, and I think that's one of the real challenges and lessons that we have learned a bit in our field is that we needed to then be working with those individuals to try to recruit the next round of literacy champions, um, and and that that lack of attention then also erodes the awareness of the problem, and in the heyday of those those kind of champions in the 80s and early 90s. Um, we had enormous kinds of attention, and people were very aware of adult literacy as a problem. Now we are, you know, fighting and scrapping as much as we can for the kind of attention that we really need. Right, right. And I know, you know, we've done a number of things over the years. You know, I, and I looked at uh, uh, when, when the organization the uh, the National Coalition for Literacy, just the, the first wave of that uh, coming out, and the people who were part of that group, and it's been, man, there are some powers here. Uh, but even at that level, at a, a coalition, coalition level, national, for this cause, we still couldn't get over the hump. What was what was happening that maybe um, created, I want to say, a, a situation where there was underachievement given the potential there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and frankly, it's it's one that uh, as I have a little more time to look at Jose, that I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at. Um, you know, been thinking about you know ways in which we we looked at and we could uh, identify what are the key mistakes either that we made or the lack of opportunity that we had during this particular time period, mm-hmm. yeah. and. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a real challenge, I think, because it's hard to say in terms of looking back, you know, what what is it that we could have done or should have done differently or better yeah. to be able to try to galvanize and take advantage of that great opportunity. We did get some additional funding during those time periods, uh-huh. but we really didn't get the level of funding that we needed to be able to make the kind of changes or remediate the problem, as, as you and I were talking about. Right. And, um, you know, I think that... Uh, it, it's one of the one of the real challenges. There are, you know, some highlights in, in some states sure. where um, they did put in, in place um, opportunities for people to both volunteer and for larger kinds of funding. Um, you know, California was a good example of that for a number of years, but then things changed rapidly. And frankly, I think one of the challenges that we did have is you know, during a number of economic downturns, one of the first things to go was adult literacy funding at both the, the state and the local level. Uh, at the national level, it stayed flat, but that's still some, somewhat of a loss. There was a lot of, a lot of money that disappeared <laughs> uh, back, in, uh, back in 2008, yeah. and, and there have been actually waves of that. And, and it's unfortunate because I do remember um, uh, the Obama administration zeroing out uh, Even Start, and, I, and that was a, a highly funded fran- fed, uh, Federal, um, federally funded family literacy project, but the, you know, that was exactly. already happening. We already saw that that was yeah. shrinking down, and I, you know, at that time we weren't. Um, nobody was writing, you know, pr- uh, proposals to the government for funding because there wasn't any money. 
you know, a lot of things tank back then. So, so you know, it really speaks to, I think, taking advantage of the opportunity when you're in the limelight as a cause uh, to to convert that. And I think we got pretty close, except, you know, pri- pre- presidents change, priorities change, and then you see, right. you know, see some of the things happening. And maybe part of, you know, what we try to communi- communicate to people here is literacy is not the flavor of the month. I mean, we see things come and go, and it's like, here's the hot thing, here's what's trending. But uh, this is not one of those things. It should never be trending. It should just be a priority. And I know you agree with That's that. That's right. You know, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Jose. And, you know, this is, this is, you know, one of the things that, again, I'd like to look at and see, you know, what is it that we can do to be able to help, you know, turn that around a little bit. Um, you know, and I'm curious about your perspective as well, because when I think back, one of the most exciting initiatives that I recall um, not being much of a part of, but observing, uh, was one that you ran working with California Literacy, um, which was Mayors for Literacy. And if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, you had dozens and dozens of mayors commit to adult literacy throughout the state of California. It was, it was the most dramatic and the largest uh, statewide mayor's initiative in the nation. Um, and, and, you know, was, was really effective. And, and I'm curious in your mind also, you know, how, how did you see uh, the pros and cons of that? And, and, and are, are there any remnants left, oh, yeah. left of that? Yeah, and we're going to pick up. We're going to go to break right now, Peter. I want to talk about Cities at Read, what you just referenced, and, uh, and just some of the things that, that, that we could be doing. So uh, I really appreciate you bringing that back up because it's, uh, it's one of those things that, that could help us out maybe in, the, in, this, in this new era, right? Anyway, you're listening to the Literacy for All radio show on WS Radio. We've been talking to Peter Waite, and we'll be back for our third segment with Peter. Uh, please stand by for these messages. Nowadays, internet devices are an integral part of your home. Everyone in your family has a smartphone, tablet, or a computer. Life is easier knowing that all your devices are secured and your family can surf the internet carefree. ESET Multi-Device Security Pack does just that. One license for all your devices. With ESET, it's simple to stay protected and save money. Enjoy safer technology with ESET Multi-Device Security Pack at ESET.com. That's E-S-E-T dot com. On the internet, your business's reputation can be unjustly destroyed in an instant. Don't wait for that to happen. Building and marketing your five-star reputation can increase your business by as much as 19%. Take control of your reputation and have the five-star reputation you deserve with Reputation Marketing Solutions by DSI Development. Become the go-to company by visiting 5starrepmarketing.com. The number 5starrepmarketing.com. Hey, it's Catherine from Listen Local Radio. Moe's Guitars has proudly served the San Diego music community since 1975. Specializing in guitars, basses, mandolins, banjos, and ukuleles, they buy, sell, trade, and consign. If you're looking for lessons, repairs, accessories, and cool gear, you found the right place. Located in downtown La Mesa Village, stop by and check out their digs or visit moesguitars.com or their Facebook page, mozeguitars.com, 619-698-1185. Tired of presentations with no impact, no inspiration, and no traction? Do dull speakers have you and your team disengaged and distracted by smartphones? Christopher McAuliffe brings energy, insights, and two decades of experience delivered with punch, humor, and heart. Your team will leave energized, uplifted, and with a sense of purpose. Visit ChristopherMcAuliffe.com to bring some heat to your next speaking engagement. M-C-A-U-L-I-F-F-E. ChristopherMcAuliffe.com. Nowadays, internet devices are an integral part of your home. Everyone in your family has a smartphone, tablet, or a computer. Life is easier knowing that all your devices are secured and your family can surf the internet carefree. ESET Multi-Device Security Pack does just that. One license for all your devices. With ESET, it's simple to stay protected and save money. Enjoy safer technology with ESET Multi-Device Security Pack at ESET.com. That's E-S-E-T dot com.
Tired of presentations with no impact, no inspiration, and no traction? Do dull speakers have you and your team disengaged and distracted by smartphones? Christopher McAuliffe brings energy, insights, and two decades of experience delivered with punch, humor, and heart. Your team will leave energized, uplifted, and with a sense of purpose. Visit ChristopherMcAuliffe.com to bring some heat to your next speaking engagement. M-C-A-U-L-I-F-F-E. ChristopherMcAuliffe.com. 